Hello moon babies, it's Molly. I'm so excited to be here with you. <laughs> I missed you guys. I wanted to say thank you for all of your wonderful messages that you sent while I was on hiatus. Nothing terrible happened. I am not a ghost or a hologram. I am very much alive. <laughs> but a combination of playing a bunch of enormous charity shows as well as getting married and being sick as a dog and having no voice <laughs> for about two weeks was putting a little damper on the videos I needed to zone in and get focused but I'm back and I'm so excited to be catching up with all of you. On that note I did want to say that I hadn't logged into my YouTube account for about a week and I had several hundred notifications <laughs> and my brain almost exploded. So if I didn't get back to your comment, please accept my apologies. I'm trying to, from this video forward, get back on track with correspondence. So thank you so much for understanding and sticking with me. So today, we're gonna talk about a much requested topic. We're gonna get into altar craft. So there have been several requests to create a video in a similar fashion to the Grimoire. Hello, Wolfie. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, in a similar vein to the Grimoire video because a lot of you seem like you're feeling really stuck with that. And I would be more than happy to talk about altar crafts. So we're gonna talk about what an altar can be for you, ways to work around some of the roadblocks, and of course, some prompts because we love prompts. <laughs> so let's get to it. So what? exactly is an altar. An altar basic definition is a place or structure where rites are performed. So that's a pretty broad working definition. So sometimes this is a collection of stuff. Sometimes this is, as the definition states, a structure which you work upon. And your altar is your gateway. It's a doorway. It's a workbench, a studio, a lab, a portal. It's your cosmic furniture. And it is a physical representation of the sacred, a tangible representation of the sacred. So we have to answer a few questions when we are constructing an altar. And regardless of what your particular tradition is, there's usually, usually a, a few considerations that we need to make. Um, the first being, what do I plan to actually do at this space? So is this a seasonal altar? Is it a healing space? Is it dedicated to your creativity? Is it dedicated to a specific deity? Is this a place of meditation, of prayer, of ritual, of magical workings? Is this a place of gratitude? Is this a place where we converse with the ancestors? Or is it a place where we just commune with the whole cosmic enchilada? That's up to you. It can be one of these things. It can be all of these things. But when we're crafting an altar, it's important to take what exactly we're going to do at this space into consideration so that we can build it to set ourselves up for success. So the next question we need to ask ourselves is what kind of space do I need? So for some people, the tradition that you follow will give you guidelines. There are lots of recommendations about where in your home an altar should be placed what direction it needs to face, um, perhaps that it needs to be outdoors. Uh, 
there's the consideration of is this a private space or is this a public space? Is this an altar that's being worked at by multiple people or a group? Or is this your very own, very private, very personal space? So where you are going to build this <laughs> lab, this studio, this workbench, consider what your privacy needs are, if any. It's going to be different for everyone. So we can also look at locations. This is the first time I've ever had a room dedicated to magic and art and anything else that I'm working on. This is the very first time this has ever happened to me. But do not underestimate the power of small spaces. My altar used to be a box that I kept under my bed. My altar has also been a closet or a wardrobe has been my sacred space. So, and I'll be honest with you, I felt no more or less magical <laughs> when those spaces were smaller and more secretive than they are now. So don't let space constrictions discourage you. A nook, a shelf, a closet, a box, a side table, a rug are all more than adequate spaces for you to do what you need to do it's up to what your personal needs are the other thing we can consider is is this altar permanent or temporary not all altar spaces are permanent they can be set up for a specific working and then rearranged or removed entirely so when we're setting up our spaces let's consider whether this is a temporary or permanent installation. So let's talk about a couple of tips, a couple her speak tips for building your altar spaces. The first, don't buy anything. <laughs> I'm not saying that stuff is bad. Clearly, I like stuff. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you are feeling stuck with your current space, the solution is not always to immediately buy stuff. It may be a matter of removing things or rearranging things. So as much as I love to acquire magical bits and bobs, we need to remember the magic is here, the magic is here, the magic is here and not here, okay? So if you're feeling stuck, fight that urge to buy something immediately. The second is if you are feeling stuck, feel free to start over. Wipe that table clean, empty that box, move that rug, clean off the windowsill, wherever it is that you are working, and start with a blank canvas. If you're worried about getting things back the way you were originally, take a picture, document it. But don't be afraid of completely starting over. It's quite invigorating. <laughs> your altar also reflects your ideas. It does not dictate what your ideas are. And what I'm getting to there is trust your guts about what's going on it. As mentioned previously, there are traditions that will assist you in what the required tools are for your mission. But if those things don't feel right to you, do not use them. An example from my own life. Up until recently, there was no representation of the sacred masculine on any of my sacred spaces. And when I was younger, the idea of including an athame on my altar freaked me the fuck out. <laughs> With what I was going through in my life at that point, I was like, you're gonna wait. It represent you're putting a what in my what? No, I don't want, I don't want. <laughs> I, I, I don't want that, I can't have that. And there was a long time where I struggled with, am I a witch because I'm not following the rule book. Don't let that discourage you. Trust your guts. Use what feels right to you at the time. Because 
our sacred spaces are living and they're going to change just like you're changing, just like your ideas are changing. And anything is possible. <laughs> but trust your guts about what goes on it. It is okay if all of your ideas about life, the universe, and everything are not represented at the same time. I think that's what can be overwhelming about altar craft for a lot of people. You do not have to have all of your shit figured out right now and have a very specific representation of every single one of your ideas cataloged in your sacred space. I don't think that's terribly natural to begin with. <laughs> we cannot be focused on everything all of the time. And if our sacred space is a place of focus, I think it sort of defeats the purpose of the sacred space, does it not? <laughs> so be selective. It's okay if all of your ideas are not being currently represented physically. Size does not matter. As I mentioned before, just because something is big and huge and elaborate does not make it more magical if you're not using it. So size does not matter. Do not be discouraged by space limitations. You also do not need a god or a goddess to have a sacred space. It is okay and wonderful and actually very liberating in some cases, especially if you're feeling stuck, to work in the abstract. You don't need to be dedicated to a god or goddess to have a functioning, potent, beautiful, sacred space. Do not be afraid to make stuff. I know there's a lot of hangups around that. Don't be afraid to make stuff, especially if you are looking for something very specific and you're not finding it. Don't be afraid to make stuff. These are things that I've found at thrift stores and I have created this Yamea figurine out of a little <laughs> plastic Mary figurine, but making things is great because you can tailor them specifically to what you want, what you need. So as far as addressing the hang up about making stuff, I know there's a lot of <laughs> anxiety around making stuff. And here's a quick spell for that. <sighs> Dear brain, thank you so much for showing me fear. You're showing me fear because you're trying to protect me from fucking up but it's paint and it's gonna be okay. Love me. <laughs> Make stuff, do it. And it will also strengthen your bond to your space if you've created your own tools. And on that note, creating that bond, you've got to feed this space. You have to feed the space by showing spending time with it. Not just putting things on it, but spending time with it. Being in front of it. Even if it's just contemplating the things on this space. It doesn't always have to be a full-blown crazy-ass ritual. It can just be reflecting upon the day where you need a minute to collect your shit and get a grip. It might be having a good cry because things did not go the way you intended. It could be where you write in your gratitude journal. It could be where you go on your bleed if that's something that happens to you. <laughs> Spending time with it, feeding it, is what's going to make it powerful. So let's talk about some prompts. Let's talk about some experiments that we can do with our sacred spaces. The first, try creating an altar using alternate correspondences. Just as an experiment to see what you come up with and what jives with you. So what do I mean by alternate correspondences? So I think a fair amount of us, not everybody, but an example that I think would be accessible for a lot of you is representations of the elements. We have incense for air, feathers, or a cup of water, shells for water. 
try coming up with some alternate correspondences that may not be particularly obvious. These could expose some interesting ideas for you and create a visually stimulating and interesting space. Let's talk a little bit about aesthetics as well. Experimenting with heights, differing heights, creating composition in that way. Books, little boxes, recycled tea containers. I've used overturned cereal bowls and water glasses to create height in my altars because that's something that I like to see. Layers of dimension. Experimenting with heights and seeing what happens there and depth. You could also choose to experiment with juxtaposing textures. So placing hard and soft items next to one another, smooth and rough items next to one another, and seeing how they vibrate when they're close together can create an interesting effect. Working with opposites, since we're talking about juxtaposing items. So working with things that are dead and alive working with things that are natural or artificial, light and dark, working on the balance between those things and seeing how the energy of those objects interact and what that means to you, what story that tells you. Color language. I feel like we talk about that a lot. <laughs> Color language is so important. Look at the colors that you have used or are trying to use and what story that tells you. You may also wish to try creating spaces within spaces. So your altar is a space. And if you're using this altar for multiple purposes, which I assume that a fair amount of us are, not always true. I have a giant main working altar, but I also have tiny altars strewn throughout the house. But if you are working with one main altar, altar space, what is this section dedicated to? What is this space dedicated to? What does this represent? spaces within spaces. You may wish to include a word of the year or a mantra as a focal point if you're trying to find ways to spend more time with your altar, if you're feeling like you have to be doing magic at your altar. Perhaps creating something that's attached more or less to your mundane life that creates that core, that creates a connection for you to want to spend time there more regularly. You could also to strengthen your bond with your altar is create a visualization around your altar. And this could take the form of warding your altar to protect any workings that you're doing there. Watchtowers are another way to do this. You can also imagine that your altar has a specific color energy or a feeling of energy and developing a visualization around that that you use when you visit this space. You can, um, this is a great idea, um, Selena Fox has an incredible archive of podcasts. She did an entire series on altar crafting, which I'm going to link in the down bar with the resources. But one of the visualizations that she had mentioned that I thought was wonderful and effective and easy is to imagine upon doing your working or whatever it is that you're doing at your altar, to imagine a beam of light moving from your altar and up like a spotlight or a searchlight up and creating a signpost for the universe. How simple, how elegant, what a great solution. So I'll include that in the down bar as well. Talking about color language as we did before, you may wish to try creating a monochromatic altar. And what that means is using items of all one color or a very similar color family. This can be very high impact, very intriguing, and it would be interesting to see how the energy of the space changes if you do this and experiment to try. An altar talk with Molly would not be complete without discussing trash. <laughs> Trash is a very important part of my practice. <laughs> I live in a dense urban area, and a lot of the things that end up on my altar are things that I find on walks around the city, things I find at the beach, things that I find in the park. Do not underestimate 
the power of synchronistic trash, you may wish to start including things that you find on your adventures on your altar as well. And this also goes for recycled items. Not necessarily that the item that you find has a particularly pertinent meaning to you psychologically, but you say this is a compelling texture or shape, or this would work great to lift something to use as an art supply. Trash is a great art supply, and what a cool way to give it a new life. You may wish to create a wash or a spray to either clear or sanctify your space. And I'll include a recipe for that in the down bar. That is a traditional component for lots of practitioners. And if it's something that you haven't tried, you may wish to give that a shot. Another experiment you might wish to try, if you're feeling sort of overwhelmed by what it is that you want to include, let's play the you're on a desert island and you have to create an altar and you can take five altar items with you. What are they? And try working with an altar that is very stripped down and simplified and see what that does for you. You may find that you really enjoy it and you may find that you absolutely abhor it. <laughs> but it's interesting to know and can help you in your path in creating in the future. We can also put our anthropologist hats on. <laughs> and this could take the form of a journaling exercise where you look at all of the items that are currently on your altar and you analyze exactly what they are for, how a practitioner you would use them in this context, the way that we read about practitioners from the past. What if you were writing about your own space and your own practice for generations to read in the distant future? This can help you get clear about why it is that you have the stuff that you have. And if you can't come up with a good reason for why you have it, which by the way, really loving it and it making you feel like a god or goddess or connected to divinity is a good enough reason. But if you cannot find a reason or you're confused by what's on it, get rid of it. Don't include it. So the anthropological exercise can be interesting. You could also try to create a public altar just to see what happens. A public altar either beginning a small collection of items in the foyer of an apartment building, in your communal laundry room, in a park, in an alley, anywhere that you can think of where there would be other people passing by and see what happens. Just as an interesting study. Do people contribute to it? Is it defaced? Does it grow? Do you see it pop up on social media? <laughs> I would love to know if any of you have experience with contributing to an altar like this. You can also, within your altar, especially if you are working in a small space, consider the inclusion of secret compartments. And this could take the form of a box within a box. It could take the form of a drawer in a bureau. It could also take the form, this is one of my, this is a cookbook that I've included on altars in the past, that I've cut away pages and included pair beads items inside. This can work well as a travel altar situation as well. To conclude the tips portion, I feel like this conversation would be incomplete without mentioning the usefulness and the wonderful nature of the astral altar. So what is an astral altar? It's exactly what it sounds like. It is a space that you create through meditation on the astral. An imaginary altar, if you will. <laughs> Why would you want to use one of these? Privacy is a great issue, <laughs> one of those reasons. The other is that it can be as elaborate as your heart desires. I like to use astral altars for healing efforts. 
because on an astral altar, I can light a million candles. I could light a candle for each one of you on my astral altar because in your imaginary space that you visit, which may also be a place that you commune with deity, if that's part of your practice, that they can work with you in that space. You can also work with multiple people in an astral space in creating it together, but you have an infinite supply in this space. Something to consider. So altar building really is a natural impulse, I believe. This desire to physically connect with our traditions and connect with a broad human story and a human history. So much to tap into. <laughs> I find it so exciting. <laughs> so I'd like you to remember that there is no altar authority and that you can do whatever your heart desires here. And I hope that you take a lot of joy in experimentation, in researching altars as well. I'd like you to remember not to be discouraged by other people's altars, because let's be real, our altars are our cosmic furniture, our sacred fingerprints, our spiritual signatures, okay? So comparing your altar to another person's altar is apples to oranges. It's comparing the Dali to the Da Vinci and saying one must be better than the other. What if they're both insane geniuses? <laughs> Enjoy that and enjoy the diversity of them, but don't let it discourage you. So I hope that this was helpful to you and I would love to see and hear about your journeys with your sacred spaces. Thank you so, so much for joining me guys. And as usual, there will be resources available in the down bar for you to explore this idea further if you wish. And I will talk to you again very, very soon, moon babies. Be well, witch on, witch boldly. Bye-bye.